Hi. It's been a while, huh, since our last podcast together. The last time we did this, we were stressing about our midterms. And now, not only are we stressing about our finals, but also Kakaen. Yeah, the whole fighting to get good locations really drained me. Where did you get, by the way? I got some place in Central Java in Pakalongan. Oh, same. I actually got the Gal. But I'm kind of nervous because I don't know anyone in my group. But I guess it's a learning experience for us, huh? And I've never been to Central Java, so it might be fun, right? I don't know if any of my I don't know any of my group members either. But let's just hope everything works out. And hey, who knows? Maybe we'll actually enjoy ourselves. Hmm. What about you, Chasa? Where did you get for Keke Kakaen? Oh, um, I'm not actually. I'm actually not doing my kaka in this semester, but I will be going doing doing it next time when registrations opens. Ah, I see. I guess we've all been busy with our own lives this semester. Hopefully, we'll be a little less busy since I heard a rumor that next semester might one hundred percent be offline. Oh, really? Wow, I can't imagine going to campus for all our classes. I mean, we've been online for so long. Well, exactly. It's going to be weird being on campus again after so long having intended classes through computer screen. I agree. Um, did any of you attend our IKK offline practical classes at URL recently? Oh yeah, I did. We did rectal palpation, right? It was a really weird feeling being inside of a cow. Yeah, I didn't think it would be so warm. But that got me thinking of our topic for today's podcast, which is female reproductive surgery. I think it's a super interesting topic. That is an interesting topic. I hope that one day we'll be able to see these types of surgeries in person. Well, maybe before we start, we should introduce ourselves. Right. I almost forgot. Hi, everyone. My name is Renee Shahan, in B0419803 from group two alongside my group members. Hi, I'm Deandra Azalea Hidayat, named B0419844. And I'm Cesaria, named B0419845. Uh, so um, what's the point we'll be touching on today? So we should probably discuss the different types of surgical procedures as well as what kind of anesthesia is used since that's such an important step before conducting any type of surgery. I agree. Um, maybe we can start with anesthesia. I remember from our lectures a few weeks ago that anesthesia in reproductive surgery, especially in female livestock, serves different purposes. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, what do you mean? Don't they all function to block or inhibit pain during surgeries? Yeah, but different types of anesthesia function differently in different regions. Like, for example, epidural anesthesia, it's an effective technique used, used to prevent or control pain during surgeries involving the tail, anus, vulva, perineum, caudal udder, and upper hind limbs. Yeah, and the administration of epidurals can only be done by um, injecting the anesthesia cranially. So if I'm not mistaken, it's between the os sacrum and the first os coccygia or caudally between the first, second, and third coccygeal bone. But what's so special about epidural anesthesia that is such a common technique in livestock? Oh, epidurals only require a small dose and volume to desensitize the caudal sacral nerves within the spinal cord. Epidurals also don't affect the function of the hind limbs during surgical procedures. Ah, so what kind of anesthesia is usually used in livestock? Or is it only lidocaine? Um, lidocaine is one of them, but procaine, um, propivacaine, xylazine, and ketamine are among the few that can be used. So they can be used in, alone or in combination. 
I see, see. Um, what, what about local anesthesia? Oh, local anesthesia usually only numbs a small area of the body. Yes, and local anesthesia is also called local blocks. So they are nerve, nerve blocks, line blocks, field blocks, and if I'm not mistaken, ring blocks in livestock. Um, but in livestock reproductive surgery, L blocks are the most common. Uh, L block is a different type of block. Mm, the L block is a type of field block. So it's used to desensitize the flank for standing flank laparotomies. Yeah, and local anesthetic is deposited in an inverted L configuration in the flank, and that's why it's called an L block. Ah, I see. But how does it differ from epidurals? Don't they serve the same purpose? Unlike epidurals, um, local anesthesia must be deposited in several layers. So it has to go through the subcutaneous tissue and also all muscle layers of the abdominal wall. Oh, and to add to that, uh, local anesthetics usually use larger volumes of an anesthetic. Often up to 100 milliliters of 2% solution is necessary for adults. Ah, okay. But in, once, in what surgeries? are these two types of anesthesia is used in. I'm pretty sure epidurals are for C-sections, right? You're right. C-sections are usually done with a combination of both epidural and local or regional anesthetic. But sometimes they can even use paralumbar anesthesia. But I'm kind of curious though. C-sections in humans and small animals are done um, while in dorsal recumbency, right? What about in livestock? Oh, if I remember correctly, a C-section in cow should be done standing up, so a standing C-section. But there are so many positions like left recumbency, right recumbency, ventral midline recumbency, and standing left oblique, to name a few. The position will obviously depend on the situation of birth. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I remember I was talking about this in class, right? Do any of you know the step for standing C-section? Well, I don't know how accurate my memory is, but it starts by guiding or placing the cow in a crate so it doesn't move around. So this just makes it easier for the veterinarian to administer anesthesia at the left flank, or was it the right flank? You were right the first time, it's the left flank. So once the cow is numb, a vertical incision is made in the flank and another incision is made on the uterus, but the placenta should be avoided. Wait, why should we avoid the placenta again? I think I missed this point during our lecture. Oh, um, I'm pretty sure it's to avoid injuring the fetus, right? Yeah, an incision with a scalpel near the placental membrane increases the risk of injury to the fetus. Ah, I see. So following this, the procedures, um, the hand of the veterinarian is usually inserted into the incision made in the uterus. So it locates the fetus's limbs and obviously the veterinarian should avoid separating the placenta from the maternal caruncles as this will permit the umbilical cord from, rupt from rupturing naturally. But in some situations, the umbilical cord has to be tied and cut when moving the fetus. Yeah, and once the fetus is removed, the incision should be closed, right? Or are there additional steps before this? Uh, yes, so the incision on the uterus will first be sutured and into the body. And afterwards, the flank incision will be sutured too. Ah, see. Um, by the way, I hear that prolapses, especially uterophaginal prolapses in livestock happen quite often. It's one of the complications of parturition in cattle and buffalo. Is, it, is that true? Well, technically, um, prolapse of the uterus may occur in any species. However, you're right in saying that it's the most, it's most common in dairy and beef cattle and also eels. It's, um, however, less frequent in sows and pretty rare in mares, bitches, queens, and rabbits. 
Yeah, and livestock are quite susceptible to this because some of the contributory causes include invagination of the tip of the uterus, excessive traction to relieve dystocia or retained fetal membranes, uterine anemone, hypocalcemia, and lack of exercise. Ah, uh, well, I wonder how prolapses are treated. I'm sure it's just as complicated as C-section. Well, actually, treatment for vaginal prolapses are rather straightforward. So what you do is you replace the vagina into its normal position with the assistance of epidural anesthesia. And then a banner stitch is placed to keep the prolapse from reoccurring. So this stitch will need to be removed once calving starts because it will impede the progress of labor and endanger not only the cow, but also the cow. Oh, I see. Well, I know you mentioned some factors uh, factors that cause uterovaginal prolapse, but did we ever learn when this condition occurs? Like at what stage in the pregnancy does it happen? Oh, this condition most often occurs in late gestation, days to weeks before the expected calving date. And during this process, the cervix remains intact, protecting the pregnancy. Mm. Mm. So other than prolapses, lacerations are also pretty common in livestock, right? I believe that there are three types of lacerations. So type one is injury to the vulva only. Type two is an injury to both the vulva and perineal body. And type three is um, injury to the roof of the vagina and also the roof of the rectum. So type three lacerations are also known as, if I'm not mistaken, rectovaginal lacerations or tearing. Yeah, I heard that rectovaginal lacerations occur in many species. Is that true? Yes, I believe so. Um, but they are reported to be more common in mares and cows than in most uh, domestic animals. But why does it happen? Um, well, most injuries occur at the time of foaling, so either as a result of um, oversized or malpositioned fetus or because of excessive manipulation during assisted delivery. Although minor injuries or lacerations to the perineum do not require surgery, but depending on the severity of the tearing, reproductive performance will be affected and may require surgical correction. Uh, but does each type of laceration require different types of treatment or are they the same treatment? Well, I guess it depends on the severity of the laceration, but from my reading of type one lacerations, the castex procedure is used. This is a procedure where the edges of the vulva lips are sutured closed to prevent aspiration of air and feces. The length of the castlets depends on the conformation of the mare or the cow. The bottom third of the vulva remains open to allow normal urination. Yes, and type 2 tears are treated with both castlets and perineal body reconstruction, while type 3 tears are treated by reconstruction of the two tubes, which are the vagina and rectum, plus perineal body reconstruction and castlets. Wow, that sounds difficult. I'm sure the lacerations are quite difficult to repair, right? It does take quite a while due to the amount of tissue trauma, but it's pointless to repair these at the time that they occur. The high degree of blunt trauma results in, the con in continued tissue deterioration and any sutures placed will basically dissolve in two to three days. Yeah, I read that while the vulva and perineal body can often be repaired at two to four weeks, type three Hair repair requires um, fibrous tissue formation and should be delayed until um, four to six weeks after injury since granulation tissue develops after five days and it's mostly made of vessels so it won't hold any of the sutures. Wow, um, I didn't know that it would take so long to repair this laceration. Yeah, me neither. It must be very uncomfortable for the animal, right? Exactly. I can't imagining I can't imagine that happening to me, but wow, look at the time we've talked for so long. You're right. We lost track of time and also in the last podcast. 
maybe we should just wrap things up now since we're running out of time. I agree. So with that being said, I would like to thank all of you for being here today and uh, being here talking about female reproductive surgery. And I hope that all of us will leave with a little bit more information on the topic. And hey, hopefully it'll be useful for us uh, for our finals. So that concludes our final podcast for this class. Thank you so much. And this is group two signing off. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye.